Hi, I'm Ryan Samaski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we're on the aft mess deck, and uh, I recently found out that at one time, Battleship New Jersey had four serving lines on the mess decks for the enlisted sailors, the, the enlisted sailors below chiefs. Now, Battleship New Jersey has always had uh, accommodations for the captain to have his meals prepared and served on, for the officers up in the wardroom, for the chiefs back aft. Uh, most of her career, she had accommodations for the admiral staff. However, I always assumed that the two serving lines we have on Battleship New Jersey were all that they had. And I'm fairly certain that all of the uh, smaller museum battleships that we've toured that are still in their World War II configurations also only have the two serving lines around uh, turret number three. So I always assume that's all there was. Uh, we recently found an interesting, uh, it seems like a, a paper that one of the ships, it seems like a paper that one of the ship's supply officers wrote in the 50s where he describes when they went from using two serving lines to four. So that set us back to reviewing the blueprints to see just how the mess decks were set up in World War II. The Iowa class battleships were originally designed for about 2,000 sailors, but during World War II, they got up to about 2,700 total, um, especially when you add in things like the, the new radars, the new anti-aircraft guns, and the flag staffs that they had on board. So because of this increased size, it seems like the Navy included more chow handling facilities than on older battleships. In addition to the two around turret three, there would have been two more roughly where I'm standing, one on each side of what is today the after mess decks. The mess decks today look nothing like they would have during World War II, and only about half of them are still used for the same purpose. So right now you've got the chow line at uh, turret number three, the forward mess deck, which is the large one, the after mess deck, and then aft of us where the gidunk was, would have also been a mess deck with other uh, dining facilities around it. These mess decks would have had fixed stools and um, like counters along the sides and then folding tables and benches that could have been brought out and configured in the middle of the space or struck down when you were using the space to show movies for religious services, uh, for when folks had to sleep in here in hammocks for a variety of reasons. However, some of these spaces had fixed facilities in the middle. So for example, the forward mess deck is where the original scullery was. Later on in the ship's career, I think around Vietnam, uh, they bump it back to the third space, which is no longer used as a mess deck. Likewise, this space had a scullery annex against the aft bulkhead. So the whole middle of this room would have been two serving lines and the scholar annex. This creates four lines for those more than 2,000 enlisted sailors that need to cycle through meals. The problem was it wasn't a very efficient process. While there were serving lines here on the aft mess deck, there was no food preparation. So at least six members of the ship's crew had to act as runners going between this chow line and the galley two spaces forward of us. Not so much of a problem, except that you've got 2,000 guys in here, in their tables and chairs, moving around, forming lines, going through the, the very small numbers of doors. During World War II, we have pictures of the ship in the South Pacific where the crew are lined up on deck, waiting to go down one of these ladders, like this one here, to get down to the chow lines. And that picture always confused me, because uh, they were much further aft than the chow line, and they were lined up facing aft. So it's like, are they coming down, going all the way forward, and then snaking back to the line? No, there was a chow line here, so they would have come down the ladder and gone straight to the line and then gone and taken their seats. But now there's this whole line of people in the way of these guys coming through with the, these big trays of food. So that seems to have slowed down the process so badly uh, that there were a lot of complaints. So the supply department in the 1950s actually started trying to find out a way to optimize things, to assembly line it. 
and uh, the solution they found was kind of counterintuitive. They stopped using the two serving lines back aft and were able to take the two or more cooks that would have been handing out food on the serving lines and the six runners and put them back in the regular chow line so they could be running food from where they're being prepared around the center of the ship out to the warming trays on the edges where the actual serving lines are. And uh, they calculated that this made meal serving 25% quicker, which meant that guys were standing in line for a significantly shorter period of time, less than 10 minutes at this point, which is not bad considering you're cycling over 2,000 guys through their meals, especially given that you're reducing the number of lines, but you're increasing the number of mess cooks and cooks that are serving on those lines. They came up with a couple of other ways to optimize things, uh, such as putting pitchers of drinks out on all of the tables rather than uh, what, forming lines of the drink machines and some of these other things, and having uh, food already set up assembly line style uh, so that rather than coming through and every new sailor gets a, a bowl of soup scooped for them right there in front of them, they, they can have somebody just making bowls of soup and somebody else just hands it to the sailor as they come through. By the later 50s, these after chow lines are removed entirely and just replaced with tables. And during the Vietnam War, uh, crew members who served on board have told us that the chow line was like we described, where it's assembly line and stuff is already plated and, and ready to be passed to them, uh, which is also the way that we handle food service during our overnight program to be as quickly as possible, where we're moving 300 people through the line. It is important that the sailors get their food quickly because you've only got something like 12 or 15 minutes to eat before you've got to rotate out. There are a finite number of uh, seats available. The major limiting factor that they found was actually the number of trays. So by requisitioning more trays so that you had 75% on hand, 75% uh, of the total crew's worth of trays on hand, meant that uh, you weren't constantly sending runners to the sculleries and back, and you already had things ready to go. Given the huge logistical challenges the Navy faced in World War II, it's amazing to me that the meal service challenge wasn't corrected until the 1950s, and that's when they really optimized the chow line. And, and essentially from then, the process remains recognizable to what is used today. Have you ever gotten to spend the night on a museum ship? Let us know in the comment section down below. I know Battleship New Jersey serves dinner in the traditional fashion. On the ships that you've stayed on, do they all do chow handling that way as well? Or do you have to bring your own food? Let us know in the comment section down below. There's a link to the article in the description below if you'd like to read it and see all of the different ways that they optimize chow handling and all the different problems that they had. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate your support. There's a link in the description below if you'd like to donate to support the museum. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about us and our channel. Thanks for watching.